because we don't have the on-air button. Okay. Good evening and welcome to the Monday, August 13, 2018 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. May we all please pledge allegiance to the flag. Councillor Valerie Randall is ill and will not be joining us this evening. Would the town clerk please uh, take the roll call? Chairman Sullivan? Here. Councillor Garvin? Here. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councillor Lennon? Here. Councillor Randall? And Councillor Straw? Here. Uh, do we have any reports or correspondence from town councillors? Mm -hmm. I have a couple items. Uh, I'd like to congratulate everybody who ran and all the people who worked hard to put on the 21st, I believe, annual Beach to Beacon race. This was held on uh, last Saturday, the 4th of August. Um, as always, incredibly well organized. And um, I do want to take a moment to thank the leadership of the race for their gracious thank yous to the town of Cape Elizabeth, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth that worked so hard to ensure a wonderful, successful, and safe event. So, thank you. Um, I also would like to ask the town clerk to update us. Um, nomination papers are available for town council as well as school board. So, if you would, please. Great, thank you very much. As Chairman Sullivan said, nomination papers for town council and school board are available. Matter of fact, they became available starting on July 30th. There are three positions for town council, three for school board. They are three-year terms. Uh, qualifications, you must be a registered voter of Cape Elizabeth and must reside in the town during the uh, term of office. Signatures required are no less than 25 and no more than 100 registered voters of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, the nomination papers are available in my office during regular office hours, Monday 7.30 to 5 and Tuesday through Friday 7.30 to 4. Uh, so far, no one has taken out papers for any of the positions on council or school board and the deadline is Friday, September 7th, uh, and we close at 4 that, uh, p.m. that day. So again, the deadline in my office for papers to be turned in would be Friday, September 7th. Great, thank, thank you. you. Anyone else? Anything else? Okay, moving along, could we please have the Finance Committee report? Thank you, Chairman Sullivan. Um, first thing, uh, the Council held a regular July workshop um, back on the 16th. And while it wasn't a finance committee meeting per se, two of the items on the agenda that day were um, finance related. If you'll recall back to um, the uh, spring budget season, uh, we had had some discussion um, both through uh, request of the manager, but also um, had sort of developed uh, through all those budget discussions about wanting to get sort of a head start on planning for fiscal year 2020. Um, so we, we started those conversations with a couple of uh, agenda items um, that will be reflected in the minutes for that meeting. I think uh, it was a healthy dialogue about uh, wanting to continue to look for, um, uh, number one, providing good guidance to the manager uh, and uh, uh, sort of prioritizing uh, fiscal objectives and things like that, but also uh, I think cooperatively and collaboratively looking for ways to um, come up with potentially new ideas or new solutions um, to some of the challenges we face on the fiscal front. So um, I expect that those conversations will continue uh, in future uh, settings, whether they be workshops or finance committee meetings or, or some other venue, but uh, encourage people to stay engaged and participate um, as they see fit. Um, secondly, referring to the dashboard, um, we're only one month into the fiscal year now, obviously having started July 1, so uh, not a lot of runway has been covered here yet, but um, as has been the case in, in recent months, um, no significant or material, um, I think, outliers uh, that I noticed, Matt. Um, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to highlight specifically from your point of view. Uh, yes, uh, Councilor Garvin, the one area that I did have was, uh, if you notice, on the state school subsidy, we just uh, 
had not received their their check until after after August 1st. So that's why you would see that it was a difference, significant difference from last year. But that would be the only uh, area that we do have. Everything else is tracking, as you can see, consistently with the over a year to year from where we were at this point last year. Um, and then lastly, uh, I know Matt's going to refer to it in, in more detail, but um, uh, tax bills have started hitting mailboxes, and um, Matt's got good news to share on that in terms of uh, a reduced uh, reduced versus forecast actual um, uh, tax uh, uh, tax increase um, that came that came with the final commitment. So I'll let Matt talk about that in his manager's report. Other than that, nothing to report from the finance committee. Great, thank you. Are there yep. any questions for uh, Council Garvin? Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we now come to the item where we have an opportunity for citizens to come before the council to discuss something that is not on tonight's agenda. Would anyone like to come before the council to discuss something not on tonight's agenda? You have three minutes, sir. We do need your name and address. Yes, so my name is Chris Munns and I live at 5 South Street. Mm -hmm. I'm here in regards to the petition that my wife and I and six other homeowners submitted to you at last month's town council meeting regarding preventing access from Astor Lane to South Street Private Road. We are asking that the town council take action and put the petition on its agenda. My family and my neighbors on both South and Stevenson Street have been subject to undue use of our road since the town planning board allowed the applicant at 8 Astor Lane to remove the gate and allow for through traffic from the public Astor Lane onto our private roads that we maintain at our cost and are subject to the liability if something happens. The applicant of 8 Astor Lane, as well as others, continue to use our one lane road as a through street instead of using Astor Lane for access. The applicant and her contractors consistently use South Street, including large trucks and cement mixers. It is only a matter of time before something happens either with a truck collapsing the culverts, or taking out the telephone pole, or more importantly, injuring one of the children that live on the streets. We're not asking the council to change the planning board's decision that allowed the applicant to take down our gate on South Street. What we are asking is that the council order that a gate be put back up on the end of the public Astor Lane. I also want to bring to your attention that the decision of May 15th is also being investigated by the Maine Human Rights Commission for being negligent in its decision by not providing adequate accommodations for my disabled son, Easton. The gate was a safety barrier and created a dead-end street, which is what it was always intended to be. The applicant, who has been our neighbor for the last four years, as well as the planning board, were aware of my son's disabilities at the time of their decision. My wife and I chose our house based on the fact that it was a dead end and provided the extra barrier for our three sons. Without the gate, it not only puts my son in harm's way from heavy construction trucks to cars driving fast so they can jump the berm. I ask that you consider this petition and put this on your agenda for next month's meeting. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to come before the council? All right, we'll close the public comment period for items not on the agenda, uh, tonight's agenda. The next item is the town manager's monthly report. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> Excuse me, I was just taking notes. Uh, as the fiscal year started on July 1st, the new year projects, projects are also underway. This week, the Eastman Road Paving Rehabilitation Project will begin with some milling of the surface taking place and new surfacing being put down. The project is estimated to take five to six days if the weather cooperates. Please be mindful that there will be some heavy equipment in use which may lead to some delays in the neighborhood on Eastman Road while the project is under construction. As Councilor Garvin did say, the new property tax bills are posted on the website and are in the mail. There is some positive news to report if you can attribute that to tax bills. The final tax rate, which was estimated to be $19.18 will be $19.02, which is a 16 cent reduction. This, will result, this is as a result of increase in the town's value due to new construction and also an increase in the homestead exemption reimbursement from the state. So those are two positive developments. The Cliff House Beach stair project is close to completion with a final installation of a granite slab as the final step to be placed. I wanted to thank the public for their patience during this installation process Unfortunately, it took place during one of the hottest 
weather stretches in memory. Additionally, the advisory sign for beach users is ordered and shall be in place shortly. Finally, on this Thursday, August 16th, the town offices will be closed so we may hold annual departmental and organizational training sessions and the annual employee appreciation luncheon. Town office will be open or reopen for regular business on Friday the 17th at 7.30 a.m. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions on the town manager's monthly report? Okay, thank you. Moving on. Uh, next item is a review of the draft minutes of the, the July 9, 2018 meeting and also a special meeting held on July 30, 2018. Could I please have uh, a motion to approve the draft minutes of the July 9, 2018 regular meeting of the council? So moved. Oh, Councilor Penny Jordan. Uh, is there a second? Councilor Sarah Lennon. Uh, any discussion on the July 9, 2018 minute, draft minutes? Oh, great. All those in favor? They're approved. The next item is a special meeting held on July 30, 2018. This was an executive session. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the July 30, 2018 special meeting? Councilor Sarah Lennon? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Penny Jordan, any discussion? All those in favor? They're approved. Okay. The next item is a public hearing on the 14 Strout Road Tower Overlay District map amendment. First we have a public hearing, hearing and then we also have regular comments in every item. Councilor Penny Jordan. I would like to recuse myself from, um, I'll start up front with the public hearing and because it's going to carry into another item. So. Um, we, uh, the Jordan family also has a relationship with Crown Castle, which is mentioned in here, and I believe I should reduce myself. Thank you. Is there any council discussion on that? Um, I think I need a motion to approve Councilor Penny Jordan's recusal. Council Sarah Lennon, is so there a moved. second? Council Garvin, any further discussion? All those in favor of approving her recusal? It's unanimous. Thank you. So again, we will open a public hearing for, uh, regarding 14 Strout Road Tower Overlay District Map Amendment. This is item number 114. Uh, anyone can come and speak to us about this. You do have a three minute limit. Would anyone like to address this item during this public hearing, which I will now open? I see no one coming forward. Again, is, would anyone like to address this item during this public hearing on the Strout Road Tower Overlay District map amendment? Seeing no one, I will close the public hearing. Is there anyone that would like to comment on this item now that the public hearing is closed? <laughs> Seeing no one, we'll move along. Item number, number 114, again, the Strout Road Tower Overlay District map amendment. Um, this has been um, recommended by the town planning board. We've looked at this several times. I'll ask the town manager to just reintroduce this item a little bit for everyone's benefit. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd be happy to. Uh, what this is is a request to uh, change the tower overlay district or tower overlay zone for, uh, for map R05, lot 24, which is up on uh, Strout Road. And what it is is to reduce the, the current size of the overlay, which at present uh, consists of the entire parcel and the applicant would like to have it reduced to a uh, different dimension. Uh, the planning board has come forward with their recommendation and they have a two phase recommendation that they have brought forward. Uh, the first phase would be to reduce the zone to a certain perimeter, which would include the, uh, for lack of a better term, the drop zone uh, for the tower. Uh, and then the applicant has stated that he wants to remove the, the existing tower. And then once that tower has been removed, uh, which should be, is supposed to be replaced or taken down no later than April 1st of 2020, then the tower shall, district shall be reduced to an even further uh, smaller circumference once it has been removed. So that has been the recommendation and uh, that is why it's here this evening. It was, uh, it came forward back in July and that's why it was here this evening for the public hearing and then for subsequent action this evening. Okay, thank you. This has been before the town council twice at least. Um, and we have the planning board's recommendation in front of us. Um, is there a motion to approve the planning board's recommendation for the map amendment? 
Council Garvin? So moved. Is there a second? Council Lennon. Discussion? Are there any comments? Council Straw. I had uh, two specific questions for the planning board. I don't know if we have anyone here from the planning board or otherwise if uh, maybe the uh, town manager could address them otherwise. I'm not aware that there are any planning board members. You know, we did we did speak with the vice chair last month, mm -hmm. but I think that we will we'll rely on the town manager this evening. Uh, uh, so, um, my understanding um, is that whenever we make a change to the zoning ordinance, the zoning ordinances are guided by and are supposed to implement the uh, comprehensive plan. So I went through the comprehensive plan, just dotting I's, crossing T's for this. I can't find any section of the comprehensive plan that's applicable, um, as in I can't find anything in the comprehensive plan that even contemplates that we have a tower overlay district. Um, Without having such a section in the comprehensive plan, I don't understand what drove and determined the planning board's decision in recommending a change to the zoning ordinance. Um, so I would like to hear from the uh, planning board, did they look at the comprehensive plan and recommending a change to the zoning ordinance, which my understanding is they're supposed to, and if so, like, what am I missing, where is it, um, and what's the justification for changing uh, the, the zoning on this lot. Has the topography changed? Um, is it no longer good for use for a tower overlay district? What is it that justifies the change? If, if I may, through the chair, uh, I, I may have uh, a, a couple of potential answers, right. if they will. Uh, we could refer to the planning board if, if, if it's not satisfactory, of course. Uh, part of the thought is, as uh, Mr. Strout talked about last month, the, the topography uh, works better in the area on this section of the parcel, but I think also they may have been emboldened by the thought of the parcel next door uh, that Councilor Jordan had recused herself on, which was last year was expanded into a, an additional tower uh, overlay zone. So perhaps the thought would be that if you had increased already with the uh, abutting parcel that you would be meeting at least the desire to do that. However, in this relationship to the comp plan, uh, I, I can't speak to that as far as there. Uh, that in relationship to it, for, for what it's worth. We could, I could always wait and get them to come back with the additional information if that'd be helpful. Also, Lynn? Um, I can speak a little bit to the comp plan, maybe, because I'm on the committee. Are you talking about the last 207 comp plan? Correct. or the 207, uh, 20, 2007, yeah. Okay, because that, I can't speak directly to tower overlays, but I can tell you that in the current plan, we're working on a very high and strong goal is to try to get better cell service throughout town, and I think that's part of what's driving this request. At least the tower. Yeah. I don't know if it's driving the switching around of the zones. I like, I'm not aware that, um, to, to kind of give you a general response, uh, in the zoning ordinance proposed changes that we've dealt with that I'm aware of. I, I don't ever recall uh, a discussion referencing the, the 2007 comprehensive plan. Um, I mean, it's a very interesting question, but I don't recall that ever coming up in the past. I don't know, it probably doesn't help you, but. <laughs> so I, I would prefer to table it. Um, if the rest of you are in favor of it, then it's gonna pass anyway. Um, I don't feel comfortable vote, voting for it without having the grounding in the comprehensive plan. Um, so I prefer to table it because then I could potentially vote for it if we get further guidance from the planning board, but otherwise we, I'm comfortable voting now. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Chris, yeah. where did you find the piece of information that says the planning board when making a zoning ordinance change has to reference the comp plan? This is my recollection, which could be wrong from when I was up back on the ZBA uh, back in the day. So. So this, yeah, I, I'm not sure it's it's a rule. It may not be, a rule, but that was a rule to be followed. I, yeah. I don't know if it's just one of your. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Again, which is why I'm comfortable voting on it, and I recognize that. So, Councilor Lennon. I mean, I kind of understand where Chris is going. In other words, you can't just create zones willy nilly. They're they're very specifically outlined and driven by the comp plan. And so I think what he's curious about is like, what's the history of tower overlay zones? What drives a decision to make another one? What's the checks and balance so there's not gonna be a ton of them? I kind of understand where he's going. Okay. Councilman, uh, Caitlin Jordan. I totally get where he's going yep. as well, but 
we're reducing the tower overlay. I mean, if you look at the history of what we do with overlays, we now have the special events overlay. It's basically when a property owner wants an overlay on their property, they come and it's driven that way by the people. These property owners now don't want a tower anymore that can happen on their property, so they're asking us to take away the overlay. So I'm not sure it's, I, I think if we were going to have this discussion, it should have been more when we were adding the overlay district, you know, a few months ago, not now that we're taking it away. So it's kind of like, why now? Okay, thank you. I mean, I, I would agree with the Councilor Jordan on that. I also think that, you know, that you're referring to the 2007 comprehensive plan, we're in the middle of, we have a comprehensive plan, pay, Committee working on our next our next comprehensive plan, and perhaps uh, perhaps um, that's something that could be addressed in the future. But I, I think Councillor Caitlin Jordan's point is very well taken. Any more discussion? All those in favor of approving the Planning Board's recommend recommendation? It is one, two, three, four. All those opposed? One. All right. Thank you. It passes. Item number 115, rotary use for Fort Williams Park. The Rotary Club of South Portland, Cape Elizabeth uh, is re requesting two days in June in 2019 for an event. Uh, this has been reviewed by the Fort Williams Park Committee, who is in favor of their request. I'm not sure if anyone would like to speak to that. Um, and. Uh, we have, uh, Tony Wagner, John Labosco. Um, my name is Tony, Tony Wagner, 11 Todd Road, 36-year um, resident of Cape, and John Labosco was our district governor, 21 Fessenden Road, 22-year uh, resident of the Cape. Uh, we are here um, on behalf of the South Portland Cape Elizabeth Rotary to request an early decision to reserve a portion of Fort Williams Park for June 21st and 22nd, 2019. That's a Friday and a Saturday. We submitted an event uh, proposal through community service, um, and that was submitted to the Fort Williams Advisory Committal, uh, Committee and approved unanimously, six to zero, uh, to move ahead with an early decision. Um, that same activity schedule and the approval from the Fort Williams Advisory Committal, Committee has been submitted to the council uh, through Kathy Raftis and Matt Sturgis. We're here to answer any questions and obtain council approval. The event is an annual conference for clubs in um, District 7780, which is Southern Maine and part of New Hampshire. Um, and it's um, typically the event is to celebrate um, this year's um, activities as, as Rotarians. Um, John Labosco, our district governor, had a vision to make this a family event, and thus we'd like to um, use a facility as beautiful as Fort Williams Park. Um, myself and other South Portland Cape Elizabeth Rotarians, at number about 65 uh, today, uh, will be involved with the event execution and proper use of the facility. Uh, we've submitted a suggestion that um, our group would like to do a service project on Friday afternoon where we think we can feel 20 or 30 people to work on a portion of the park so that when we leave on Saturday evening, it's better than when we got there on Friday morning. Um, we hope you'll consider our request. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those for you. Thank you. Are there, are there any questions? Uh, Councillor Caitlin Jordan? I was just going to ask, where have you held it before? We, so typic we typically hold it at uh, function halls, um, hotels and other convention centers and that sort of thing. Uh, John had a vision to engage younger Rotarians and their young families, um, and it's been um, wholeheartedly accepted by the 1,700 members of our district. Um, so this is a first time uh, deal for us as far as doing this type of event uh, in a park situation. Anyone else have questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve the request uh, of the, the uh, Rotary Club of South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, to reserve June 21 and June 22, 2019, the picnic shelter at Fort Williams for their event? So moved. Second. Right, did you get that? Councilor Penny Jordan moved, and Councilor Caitlin Jordan second. Is there any discussion? Any further comments? I think. Okay, Council. Oh, just a 
I have a question. I assume Family Fund Day is the 15th, correct? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. That was a just that was, to, that was a live discussion. Looking at the <laughs> way the calendar for that month falls, I just well, it could have been either or. So I just wanted to make sure. And then it's going to be a, a busy June then for Cape Elizabeth. Fun day, Rotary, Strawberry Fest. Boom, boom, boom. Great question. Thank you. Um, Council Straw, put oh. your hand up. Um, I, I would just acknowledge I'm extremely grateful for all the Rotary Club has done for both Cape Elizabeth in general and for Fort Williams in particular. Uh, ironically, in particular with respect to the picnic shelter and all that they've done to help us with the picnic shelter. Um, that caveat being said, I do support the date, but the waiver of the fees, um, I'm not, I, I want to just adopt a um, unilateral approach that uh, if you're a Cape Elizabeth resident, we do give a reduced fee, but I'm not comfortable waiving fees. Um, it might be different if this was just the local uh, rotary, but this is the regional rotary. Um, so for that reason, I'm not in favor of waiving the fees. But I am very appreciative of everything they've done. Thank you. Any other comment? All those in favor? It is four in favor and opposed? Council Starr opposed. All right. The item passes. Okay, item number 116, the Fort Williams Park Committee report relating to pay and display parking at Fort Williams Park. Uh, before I open public comment on this item, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the Fort Williams Park subcommittee for their work. They were asked by the town council to gather data. This was a, a request for research. Uh, not a request for an opinion, but rather, again, a request for research on the various possibilities and types of pay display that, that the town uh, council could consider going forward. So at this mo uh, moment, I'd like to offer public comment on this item. Would anyone like to address the council on this item? Victoria Valen, 58 Cottage Farms Road, and I do also want to thank the subcommittee for all their work. Uh, I, th I do think this is a very good plan for moving forward. And uh, my only suggestion would be um, possibly reviewing the, it's called the daily Parker rate. Um, I, I think that rate is a little too low. I think that we should be reviewing that rate. Um, our, our park with its million dollar view, um, if you compare it to some other full day charges that are um, charged by uh, at other parks in the region, for example, um, if you go to um, Sebago Lake, each individual in a car for all day parking is $8, and that's per individual. Crescent Beach is $8, once again, per person for all day. Um, so that would be the only comment I'd like to make. It's a very good plan, very supportive, of it, but I think the rate is a little too low. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this item? All right, thank you. I'll close the public comment period. Um, <clears throat> so we've all received this report uh, that the subcommittee has put together, and the other thing I'd like to say is, um, in, in, in another uh, way to thank them is that they normally, the, this committee, nor, uh, the Fort Williams Park Committee normally does not meet in August and sometimes not in July and because of a very successful model of really getting an intense subcommittee to work on a prior issue with the park, we asked them to do this again in this venue and they, they created a subcommittee, they met several times, uh, very, very uh, data-rich mining research meetings, and they have done this in time for tonight's council meeting. So again, I, I want to thank them for that effort. They, they went through to a great effort to get all this done um, when they usually don't meet at all so that they could bring us this information. I want to ask our town manager to just speak to this item a little bit, and essentially what we're recommending is that we, we move this to a workshop because there's a lot that the council is going to want to discuss on that. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, yes, as you can see, there, there is a great deal of work here, uh, and the subcommittee, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Jim Kearney, uh, Ken Pierce, and Mark Russell for the work that they did on this. Uh, it was Yeoman's work, as well as Kathy Raptis, who uh, she and myself uh, attended all the meetings, and uh, there were robust discussions. Uh, to Mrs. Valent's comment, 
that is a very live uh, point that was discussed uh, amongst the subcommittee uh, with the full acknowledgement that council ends up sending, setting the fees as it is. So this would be the initial recommendation, but, uh, but ultimately it comes down to the council for setting fees on any uh, fee area in the, in the town. So um, that being said, the recommendation would be to, uh, in order to have a thorough vetting of the information, would be to uh, send it to a workshop for September 17th, which would be the next the next available workshop for the council. Uh, at that point, you could look at all of the recommendations or the information that's been provided. And uh, this has also been reviewed by the park committee, and that's they, they did, as, as Chairman Sullivan did say, they did get together and meet last week in order to, to bring this forward to the council, looking at the, the, the need to get the information out there. Uh, there are multiple facets to this, but, but to get into it at this point, I think it'd be better served at a, at a workshop. So that would be my recommendation. That is a pretty cool answer. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, is there a motion to uh, uh, receive the uh, report of the Fort Williams Park Subcommittee on pay and display and to uh, send this to, I believe we have a September, September 17 workshop. Is there a motion? So moved. Councilor Penny Jordan, is there a second? Councilor Lennon, I think. Is there any discussion? Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Going through there, I didn't really see anything that talks about visitors to the businesses, the, the people that we have renting, like Officers Row. Um, did I miss it or is it just not addressed? Yep. Um, it's the town manager can Yes, it's a, uh, there's a park to the, uh, sorry, a part to the rear uh, of the park near the officer's row area that will be, we'll try to have that signage appropriately for the patrons of those buildings and that area will not be metered for, for uh, pay display, pay and display parking. Uh, there are other areas as well that will be considered free parking areas as well. Okay, it says officer's row is 28 spaces for the patrons of Fort Williams Park. So, There'll be more spaces on top of those 28 that are just for patrons of the businesses. I think part of those 28 spaces will be specifically earmarked for, okay. for use for the buildings. Okay. Any other comments, Councilor Straw? Uh, just briefly on that um, for Councilor Caitlin Jordan's uh, reference. So it's on the first page under parking configuration under the three additional lots. They, it's a very small item, which I missed the first time also, which is officer zero parking. Um, but they don't go into detail about it. The, yeah, that's, so where it says to be reserved for clients? Yes. That's, I did, I missed that, those five words. Yep. And, and just as a general point to the public, um, just to reiterate that uh, the Fort Williams Park Commission doesn't necessarily agree with this. They're, they did this because we asked them to. This is our request that they do this data. And a key aspect that I don't think we asked them to do, but I thought was really good, was the proposal that uh, there's going to be a section of free parking that will remain free within the park. Any more discussion? Council Lennon? Just a quick question. Are the fees for buses and trolleys going to be in our, on our workshop agenda as well? We may have that on the September uh, actual council agenda because you had the workshop already okay. with, uh, so that we're looking to guide that towards uh, September 10th okay. for the recommendations. Okay. Any, anyone else? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Item number 117, review of the proposed settlement agreement relating to Paper Street sections of Surfside Avenue. Before I open uh, the opportunity for public comment, I would like to say a few things to maybe clarify the process. Um, this, as you know, is due to a lawsuit against the town regarding Surfside Avenue, the Paper Street. Uh, Several of us town councilors participated in a court-required mediation that took place on July 19. It was all day long. Three councilors, Councilor Jamie Garden, Councilor Sarah Lennon, Jamie Garvin, I'm sorry, Councilor Sarah Lennon and myself. Um, uh, in the end, we agreed to bring this proposed settlement forward to the full council, um, which we did on July 30th during an executive session. Uh, we agreed to put this on tonight's agenda for council consideration to move forward to a public hearing. I, I just want to make it clear this is not a done deal. The council has not voted on this. Um, that's important for people to realize this is still very fluid, you know, in action, and we are, we're looking at this seriously. Um, so no, no agreement has taken place yet. 
Well, we will start looking at this tonight and we will set this to a public hearing. Um, I, I myself am personally opposed to the settlement, but as chairman, I have worked in very good faith and supported the orderly process of bringing this forward to the full town council and also to the town agenda tonight and hopefully to a public hearing forward, going forward for our citizens to comment. Um, after the public comment, I will invite our attorneys to, to review the structure of the settlement. I'm sure that everybody will be interested in hearing that. And Matt, would you like to add anything at this point? No, I think, I think that would probably be the, yeah. oh, sorry. Yep. Suggestion. Okay, sure. Council Why Mayor. don't we hear from the attorneys first? Because I think yes. that might be really helpful in people's comments to set the facts and the record and information. I mean, okay. I think there's actually a lot of misinformation floating around. Right. If that's in council rules, I think that would be very helpful. Well, why don't we see what the will of the council is? And Jamie, Councilor Garvinhead is going to make the very same suggestion. Okay, great. Okay, so I, seeing that everyone is fine with that, so am I. Why don't we proceed that way? And here comes Derwood Parkinson, uh, our our attorney on this matter. Good evening. Council. I'm here with uh, Ben McCall, who was also present at the mediation, along with uh, my law partner, Susan Driscoll. Um, it was, yes, a long day, um, and there was a lot of back and forth. Mediation by nature is, is confidential. Um, it is intended to get the parties to speak freely and to uh, um, bargain their position as hard as possible. What, what makes this different you know, than other mediations is it involves a municipality, and with a municipality, decisions have to be made in, um, in front of the public after a public hearing. And so that was understood. And um, in order to, to further that process, so um, certain documents have been drafted. And there's really two key documents. One is a, a so-called consent final judgment. And uh, the other document is a settlement agreement. Let me work, your, work you through these documents without uh, hopefully getting it just right uh, between too little and too much detail. Um, so there's a pending lawsuit. Lawsuits can be settled. Uh, lawsuits can be settled by a dismissal um, or they can be settled through what is called a consent judgment. And this is a, a judgment uh, that will, the language will be agreed to by the parties, assuming the council agrees, um, and then approved by the judge. And that is the final action uh, that puts the lawsuit to rest. And so the key components of um, the consent judgment is, uh, one, that the town would be releasing any, any claim it has uh, in Surfside Avenue um, or the strip of land between Surfside Avenue and the ocean. Now, if we had a, a map, and we could easily pull up a map if we wanted to, there are little small um, ledge outcroppings and, and um, uh, portions of property shown in green on a survey between Surfside Avenue and the ocean. Now the town's never uh, asserted ownership to that, but we would be releasing ownership to that. And the portions of Surfside Avenue um, in front of the plaintiff's property. Um, that sounds a little complicated, and it's not intended to be uh, complicated by doing it that way. It was really only because those parties were the ones that were in the case uh, not everybody on Surfside Avenue was actually in the case, and so um, it was seemed inappropriate to be uh, talking about an outcome affecting people who were not in the case. So we're talking about um, releasing any uh, claim uh, to Surfside Avenue and the pro property um, between Surfside Avenue and the ocean. The second key component is uh, vacating, deeming, deeming vacated that portion of Surfside Avenue uh, in front of those very same properties. Now, we've been here many times, and I won't go through the whole book about paper streets. Uh, paper Street, as you know, is a street that is shown on a subdivision plan, uh, but was never built. The town has incipient rights, meaning it doesn't have actual title or actual right to use those properties until uh, they are accepted. So in the prior hearings we've had, many, many of these hearings, there's essentially three baskets these paper streets go into. One basket is uh, to accept the paper street, uh, and move forward in uh, using the paper street as a, um, a road or a path or a utility easement, um, 
and that has been done in some cases. Another uh, path is to extend the period of time until 2037, which state law allows us to do, uh, to, for the town to exercise its rights of incipient dedication in the Paper Street. That's the current status of, of Surfside Avenue. What this settlement do would move, it, move the Paper Street Surfside Avenue from the category of being extended to being in the category of being deemed vacated. And that's a, a, a straightforward process which just says that the town is no longer interested in accepting its incipient dedication rights. Does that make sense? Okay, then um, finally, two or three more uh, key components. One is um, the, a constant theme throughout this, even though the, the folks who are, gather yeah, many of them are here tonight, who are uh, extremely interested in the uh, in the outcome of uh, uh, Surfside Avenue, how the private rights will or will not be affected. And while we're not the attorneys and uh, the town doesn't represent, obviously, uh, anybody's private rights, uh, it, it certainly was a consideration in the discussion. And for that reason, under paragraph 13, there's a specific paragraph that says that the town um, may not pursue any rights uh, under certain sections of the law, and I'll, t and I'll uh, or I'm sorry, um, no party, meaning the plaintiffs, uh, will not pursue any rights under um, these sections of Title 23. And I'll explain them in just a second without hopefully going into too much data overload. But this is a key sentence. Nothing in this judgment shall diminish the private rights of any person to the portions of Surfside Avenue that abuts the Khalidi property, the Leopold property, the Summer slash Ross property, the Wooden property, and the Pilot Point property. So that was intended to make it clear on the official record that would be signed by the court, this would be recorded in the registry, that this judgment didn't somehow, in a way, um, took away something um, uh, from the folks who had have private rights. Um, the, the court case didn't involve directly those private rights. The, the sentence before about the rights to pursue action under t Title 23 uh, was intended to um, as an additional measure to uh, provide a bit of added protection for the back lot owners in that now with that sentence in place, the plaintiffs uh, will be prevented from using their rights under those sections to attempt to extinguish the implied rights uh, that exist in those streets. We're not talking about the uh, express rights that one might have in a deed. We're talking about implied rights by virtue of being on a plan. Now I know that's kind of kind of fuzzy and complicated, but there's basically express rights. If you have a deeded right away, that is um, almost impossible under my main law to take away. Um, and there are also a category of implied rights. And what this that sentence is in, intended is to um, put a, a roadblock from the plaintiffs attempting to take away those rights. So, um, and of course. Uh, the kind of the last and most important, one of the most important parts of this is uh, what is the town getting out of this? Um, besides um, avoiding costly um, and uh, costly and protracted litigation, uh, the risk uh, of which is um, always difficult to know the risk in, in litigation, um, basically around three issues. Has this paper street been uh, vacated by the common law. If it has been, if it has not been vacated, does the town, in fact, then have a right to install a path? The first question is a very fact-intensive: whether it's been vacated under the common law. The second question about whether, if it hasn't been vacated, you won't get to the second question. If the first question is yes and it's been vacated under the common law, the second question about whether it's been, if it's been not been vacated, whether a path can go down there is an unsettled issue in Maine law. So what you are in a sense essentially doing if you choose, of course this is a council decision uh, to approve this, is uh, you're managing that risk of an adverse result. Um, and, and of course uh, the key element or one of the key elements is that the town would be receiving $500,000 in a cash settlement uh, from the plaintiffs. Uh, for entering into this deal. Uh, 
one could say that that is a better result than you would get if conceivably better resulted than if you won the court case. You could win the court case and you wouldn't have the 500,000. Um, and then you might be left in a situation where having to decide whether it was even appropriate to build this path given uh, some of the challenges that exist. Um, so that's one way of looking at it. Of course, there's other ways of looking at it. Uh, you're the clients, your decision. Um, I'm here to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, I, I have one. <laughs> I, one thing I do want to clarify, and I, I know um, that um, I asked the town manager to re reach out on you on this today, but for the benefit of all of us, you know, we're considering to whether or not to send this to public hearing tonight for a public hearing in September. What I want to uh, clarify is that by doing so, we are not initiating the vacation process. Uh, I don't believe you're initiating the vacation process. We are talking about a resolution of a pending litigation matter. And um, I don't think any clocks are running as a result of that discussion. Great. Is that clear? Great. Thank you. I Councilor Garvin? Yeah, as a matter of procedure, I think even if we, um, if you to play this forward, if we go to the public hearing and then ultimately decide to have a vote on whether or not to accept the agreement, mm -hmm. we will subsequently actually need to take action, whether it be at, at the meeting where we vote on whether or not to accept the agreement or a, a future meeting to actually formally do that, right? Uh, uh, oh, Councilor Garvin. Yeah, there's something about that, isn't there? Yeah, I, I just wanted to address that. Yeah. Um, I, th I think the intent of the consent judgment is to wrap all that into, into one piece. I don't think that there needs to be a separate um, vote at a later time than to deem it vacated. Basically, if the council votes to deem it vacated by approving the consent agreement, that effectively shifts the, the, the street from that one basket to the other basket. I don't think you need to have a separate process. If you'd Just like for the to, formality of it. Right. I don't, I don't, okay. If you'd like to, but I don't think it's necessary. And another question I have about that is that <clears throat> would that then preclude the need for the town to notify everyone in the subdivision and all that? I mean, because when we went through our entire Paper Street inventory uh, in 2016, um, you know, we had notified, you know, everybody within certain, so many hundred feet of any Paper Street, people in various subdivisions. So you're saying that Again, voting to go to, to send this to a public hearing to receive public comment does not start initiate the vacation process. However, should we subsequently decide to approve this settlement, that will essentially vacate right. those properties listed in the settlement agreement. Um, however, doing that, are, do we need to notify people? I think that we uh, did that. It's true in other cases out of an abundance of caution, but I don't think you were required to do that. Um, and, and, and certainly that would be a, um, an option that you could use to attempt to make sure the word's out there that no one can claim they didn't get the word about what was happening. Councillor Caitlin Jordan. To the notification process is mostly so that people understand the triggering of those other um, statutes that could take effect that cannot take effect with our agreement that we have drawn up right. here. The way it's drafted is they cannot take effect, but even somehow they could take effect. Uh, the deem vacation one actually, the start of the trigger is the property owner sending a notice to those fo the, the folks in the subdivision, uh, which requires them to within 180 days to right. start a litigation. I know it's, it's, it's very sort of confusing, but that's a, the mechanism when the property owner sends out something. And that did actually happen down in this neighborhood you know, in early, an earlier piece of litigation mm -hmm. where such a letter was sent and that triggered a need. But it's not from the date of the dean's vacation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Did any other counselors have questions for, for uh, Drew? Okay. All right, uh, <clears throat> moving along, I would like to now uh, open the opportunity for public comment. We have a 15-minute period. Each individual 
may have up to three minutes. We do need your name and address. Would anyone like to address the council on this item? I'm Victoria Valen, 58 Cottage Farms Road. Um, I would just ask that the um, council, I was going to ask that you renegotiate the settlement agreement, but it doesn't sound like renegotiation is an option, and I just want to have that clarified. I think the negotiated settlement price is too low. Um, I would not support it. I also want to um, uh, request that from the chair that on the September 10th agenda to not include a vote on the settlement agreement. Um, if you could, please set aside that meeting to hear from the residents, because you're only going to give 15 minutes, maybe five people, regarding the settlement agreement. That's what's on the table. Mm -hmm. I know the council is very aware of the overwhelming desire of citizens to not vacate this paper street. However, the council has not heard from residents regarding their view on the settlement agreement. So if you could, I would ask that you please allow September's 10th meeting to be then that opportunity for all citizens to have their opportunity to give a public statement to the council and also to hear some of the discussion that will take place that evening from the subcommittee on how you got there. Um, that discussion um, may generate additional questions, it may change opinions, um, it's a good time for that listening that I've heard from other council members that is so important that we listen to citizens. So that would be my request, and so I please ask that the council renegotiate or do not accept this settlement because the price is too low, and to not include the vote on the settlement agreement to take place on September 10th. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question to clarify her comments? Yes. Ms. Wallen, is your, is your desire to renegotiate simply the price? I see this as So, so let me, re actually, sorry to interrupt. Let me re it, it, were there a price that you were agreeable to? Y you, you have no other objection or? No, I do. I have an objection. Okay. That's I what never, I just wanted to clarify. Right. I never thought. It just seems like I, I think the city would have started at a million and you settled at 500,000. So where did they start? At zero? It's just, how do we get to 500,000? I'm assuming we started at a million and we met halfway. Thank, Thank you. Hi, my name is Paul Mosen. I'm a 21-year resident of Cape Elizabeth, live at 22 Trundy Road. Uh, I've been involved in helping get the petitions signed, and I'm going to read to you again as a reminder, even though all of you have seen copies of the petition so far, it says, we demand the Town Council of Cape Elizabeth not to vote to vacate the valuable town assets, Surfside Avenue, Atlantic Place, and Lighthouse Point Paper Streets. We further demand that the Town Council votes to accept those paper streets in their entirety so that they will be protected forever and for all Cape citizens to enjoy. We now have well over 1,400 signatures. And we have been approached by many people who say, I hadn't signed, let's get this thing going again. The, the, what has just occurred recently has a lot of people's ire up. My suggestion is the September meeting that's gonna be open for public hearing, you're gonna need a room at least twice, if not three times this size from just my own personal contact with the citizens in this, in this town. So again, I've given you the name, the number, 1,400 plus signatures. I've told you what that's all about, and we're hoping you're going to think about what the citizens want. Not what a few people want, but what the majority of Cape Elizabeth citizens want, and that you as their representative will act to do exactly what they want. Thank you for your time. I am Jim Mora, 5 Wombat Road. We have five lot owners on a lawsuit that want the town to vacate portions of Surfside Avenue Paper Street. And we just heard 1,400 residents on a petition that want the town to accept the Surfside Avenue Paper Street. If you continue with the settlement proposal, you tell the world that Cape Elizabeth town government does not follow the fundamental American principle of government for the people, but rather acts to the advantage of small, wealthy special interest groups. 
If you continue with the settlement proposal, you show the world that Cape Elizabeth town government does not act consistent with the fundamental American pr principle that all men are created equal, but rather acts in preference to those with more financial resources. This will result in the general public losing confidence in their government. No monetary settlement value is worth the loss of confidence in government. You may see a settlement proposal. I see instructions. Instructions for other lot owners with abundant financial resources to follow to get what they want at the expense of the general public. The town will incur more legal costs with each additional lot owner that follows these instructions, your instructions. In the end, these legal fees could exceed the $500,000 proposed settlement amount. This would leave the town with a net gain of absolutely nothing. The proposed settlement is a bad deal for the majority of residents. If the town council does not have the will to do what the general public clearly wants, based on what I understand, is more than twice the petition signatures the town has ever seen before, take this off your task list by bringing this to the voters in November. Uh, good evening, my name is Sue Garrett, 2 Katahdin Road, Cape Elizabeth, Maine, 56-year resident. And again, thank you to all of those who serve on the town council. We've been here many times. Tonight, please remember this number, 357. This mediated document is not worth the paper it is written on. It takes away all of the rights of the neighbors and the 1,400 petitioners making up the Shoreline Access Group, 357. This mediation now requires those with residents with private rights to spend thousands of dollars to file to protect their own rights on legal fees, 357. Chairman Jim Waltz put in writing that the town would never abandon these rights, 357. After good group discussions, why was an mediation set then? As those who were engaged supported accepting the paper street, and that was in the town council's control, 357. There is no protection for quiet use and enjoyment to the residents in this mediated document. There is no enforcement or remedy for breach, 357. Why aren't we accepting the remainder of Surfside, 357? You were taking $500,000 from five families, but the mystery is solved. It would only cost 1,400 of us on the petition, $357. Remember that number, $357. If the town is for sale, we will crowdsource. We will seek protection for quiet use and enjoyment of our shorelines. We will seek enforcement or remedy for any breaches of any mediations that the town does to jeopardize our rights. $357, that is what you did not ask from us, only five residents. Sarah McCall for Avon Road and Shore Acres, and I haven't been up here for a while, so here I am again. Um, my daughter's with me, and we'll take just a minute and 30 seconds each. Um, I have been in Shore Acres for 35 years, and I hope to be here for another 35, which will make me 97, and I intend to walk down on the shoreline. Um, my rights are being eroded um, by this action, and what I ask of you is to take the long-term view, because the erosion of the gravel part of Surfside, as well as Trundy Beach, will happen in the next 35 years. There will be more storms that will be more intense, and there will be probably very few days, it, it, well, there will be a lot of days where you won't be able to walk down there. We need to preserve that higher piece of property for everybody to walk on. I have deeded rights. I hope to keep them. I hope that my roads, rights are not eroded um, and that you will finally um, accept the paper street. And this is Katie McCall, who is also living at 4 Avon Road. Hi, again, Katie McCall at 4 Avon Road. 
Um, I've lived in Shore Acres since I was born and taken home from the hospital for 18 years. Um, and I grew up in a neighborhood where we all ran around and enjoyed the neighborhood and the, and the town that, that we were provided. Um, I've lived abroad for four years and I always talk about my childhood and this, this town, how it's such a quintessential, amazing place to grow up because of our nature and our shared rights um, and our openness to each other and the place that we live. Um, for me, it's not about money. It's not about um, anything but the ability to walk around and to be open to one another and enjoy what this town has to offer. And I would love to have that for my lifetime and my children's lifetime. So thank you. I'm Maynard Murphy. I live at 24 Pilot Point Road. Last week I read the settlement agreement between the plaintiffs and the town, and I still think the town should accept Surfside Avenue in its entirety. However, if you still wish to push it through, more needs to be done to strengthen and protect the deeded and implied rights of the neighbors in the subdivision. Uh, also, the settlement agreement, in the settlement agreement, I noticed something that needs to be cleared up before this goes through. The third paragraph says, quote, whereas there is an alleged paper street known as Surfside Avenue that runs roughly parallel to Pilot Point Road, but across the back of the plaintiff's property at the point where the plaintiff's properties meet the ocean. This is certainly not accurate. First, the paper street is not alleged, it's fact. Second, their deeds clearly state that their property lines abut Surfside Avenue. There is no mention of their property lines going to the ocean and therefore also no mention of Surfside Avenue crossing their properties. You don't have to take my word for it. You can look it up in the Registry of Deeds. And that may also necessitate a change in the next paragraph which says, seeking among other, among other things a declaratory judgment that Surfside Avenue no longer exists on their properties. Well, according to their deeds, it never did. This is also the same misinformation that has been perpetuated over the last several years by some of the plaintiffs, some of their friends, and some of you counselors, even after you have been given the information I stated above. For example, the paper street is in their backyards. People are walking in their backyards. I guess people believe what they want to believe and figure that if they keep repeating it, that it will become truth. The courts historically give great deference to municipalities. The acceptance of Surfside Avenue should be successful. After all, it's on the town greenbelt plan. It supports at least one of the objectives of the comprehensive plan. Shoreline access is highly important to Cape citizens. The Conservation Committee commissioned a study and a survey and a rustic trail was approved by the same. It has overwhelming support of the citizens of Cape, including many of my neighbors. And 1,400 petition signers from all parts of town who want to preserve ocean access. I'm sure you'd like to check this off your list and move on to the next thing. This is too important to just check off your list. You have every right to accept Surfside Avenue. I hope that you do, thanks. Priscilla Armstrong, 18 Avon Road. I'm a 30 year resident of Shore Acres and I'm extremely, I feel that there is not adequate protection of my rights in the language of this settlement agreement. I also think it's a pretty dreadful precedent to accept money to avoid the possibility of further litigation, um, which really benefits five property owners. But if you're going to do that, you should be extremely careful that you have also ensured the rights of all of the other property owners in Shore Acres and have not put us right back in the same situation which we were before of potentially being forced into a position of litigating to reinforce our deeded rights. It makes me very sad to have this controversy. It makes me sad that we have a reputation now of being an unwelcoming neighborhood with neighbors not speaking to other neighborhoods, neighbors. It certainly was not the case when I moved here and it was not the case not so very many years ago. 
But unfortunately, my experience through these last couple of years have taught me that my rights can be ignored if it doesn't suit the fancy of some people in the neighborhood. I don't feel that the town has simply done enough to ensure the rights of the majority of the lot owners in Shore Acres. But because ultimately I'm sure that it is the will of the council to accept this settlement and vacate its rights to Surfside, I really urge you to make sure that the language ensuring the rights of the Shore Acres residents over Surfside Avenue, and I mean all of Surfside Avenue, is re-examined and beefed up, and the plaintiffs in this issue sign off on this, and we end the controversy in our neighborhood once and for all. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Before we continue, we have reached our 15-minute limit on public comment. So in order to continue, I would need uh, agreement by the council to perhaps add one more 15-minute comment. What are councilors thinking? I, mean, I, I, I see how many more people would like to speak? Just a few. What, what are, what are councilors? Six, six minutes. Shall we keep going? All right, so we'll limit this to a maximum of one additional 15-minute period. Okay. We've got two people who want to speak. They okay. get three minutes each. I mean, we're having a whole public hearing True. just on this in a month, which I think is going to take hours. Right. So I... Yep, Councilor Lennon? Yeah, I, I, for me, it's a fairness issue, because on our agenda, it says our entire job right now is to just decide whether to set it to a public hearing. And so many people perhaps did not come thinking it wasn't the appropriate time to speak. So I don't like turning it into an impromptu public hearing for that reason. I'm more than happy to have two more people speak. That's, that's, that's my concern. Okay, so what we'll do is, seeing as there are only two people that have indicated they're willing to speak, we will limit it at these two. Is that the will of the rest of the council? Okay, thank you. Your name and address, please. Florence Braff. I live on Hannaford Cove Road, and I am not a holder of any right to any paper street on Surfside but I have a general concern about the town. And this particular dispute had, potentially could be a precedent for a paper street that is close to me up on Lighthouse Point. It is upsetting to think that the town can be threatened in this way, that the fear of the litigation would permit them to give up the rights. And these are rights that if, they, if, the, if the community gets them and they're reinforced, will be in perpetuity. I also am concerned for the reputation of the, of the town. When I saw the headline in the Portland Press Herald, it was disturbing because that is the implication that, the whole, that this town can be threatened because we have a number of wealthy people who would like to protect their private interest as against what is potentially a long-term vested public interest. I know we have many hours of debate, and it's worth it, because it's a very important question. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Deborah Murphy. I live at 24 Pilot Point Road, and I'm speaking as president of the Shore Acres Improvement Association. Um, I want everyone to know that Shore Acres is, is a really caring and thoughtful neighborhood. I've lived there since 1998. Um, and I've enjoyed, as Katie has, the openness and sharing. Unfortunately, that's changed in the last five to ten years uh, in a big way. Um, we welcome Cape citizens in our neighborhood just like they welcome us in theirs. It's all about sharing. I mean, we're all here for a pretty short period of time, relatively speaking, and if we can't share wonderful things like shoreline access, I'm not sure um, what could be more important, at least on this issue, than that. It's really important. There's not a lot of it, and it's not growing in size. People are taking it away. So I'm hoping that you will reconsider and vote to accept, because I do believe that that's the right thing to do. Um, right thing to do isn't always the easiest thing to do, but it is the right thing to do. Um, as someone mentioned, the courts do give great deference to municipalities. I think you're in pretty good standing if you accept this. I don't think that legal challenges will undo it. Atlantic Place was um, an issue, as Mr. Parkinson mentioned. 
And we prevailed, and why did we prevail? Because the town's rights were alive and well. So that's on a 20 foot wide section of this portion of the Surfside, the upper portion of Surfside. If that can pass that muster, the rest of it can. We're talking an, uh, Pilot Point, it's 50 feet wide. There's a lot of room down there. Um, with that said, if the town does decide that they want to go into some sort of agreement, the agreement that you have right now does not protect Shore Acres lot owners' rights. I, and I really appreciate that you want to do that. So if that's the intent of the council, it needs some modifications. Um, and we'd be glad to, to help work on that. Um, we would definitely need something affirming the rights of all lot owners from the abutters, and it would need to be some recordable uh, instrument where they affirm all of the rights um, to ensure that they can never be taken away, and not just by Title 23 and the paper streets um, litigation possibilities, but the other legal processes are not mentioned in this agreement, and there are other legal avenues that these folks can take. And after the town vacates and their overwhelm, overarching um, uh, rights that secure our rights are gone, um, it feels like open season on Mr. us. Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy yeah. your time is up. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, and I also, if you could question the deemed vacated process, because that's historically the just do nothing, and this is not a do nothing. Two legislative acts have occurred on this, so I don't feel like the deemed vacation process is appropriate. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we're now closing the public comment period. And, okay. So I, I'd like to start the, the discussion, Councilor Lennon. I'd like to ask Derwin a couple more questions. Is that okay? Yes. Uh, well, in fact, uh, Councilor Garvin had a question about renegotiation, and uh, so yes, if Derwin, if you please come up and oh, you did. Did you have a question about no. can we renegotiate? No. Uh, somebody, I somebody did. Oh well. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, Councilor Lennon. So I have three questions for you that are all closely related. I'll just give them all to you, and you can answer them in the way that's most logical. The first one is: Is it correct that that any action we take um, impacts the deeded and applied rights. In other words, they're saying that sort of, I think the concept here is that somehow we're like the giant in the room and we can protect their rights, but I had understood that these were two relatively separate issues. One was the town rights and one is the subdivisions rights. That's my first question. My second question is, um, in your professional opinion, are those rights that they have more protected by this settlement or by the possibility that we see this entire litigation through and we lose? Which would put them in a more vulnerable position. Um, and my third and final question is, um, is it your professional opinion, and I believe that we left that day thinking, that this particular settlement um, is very favorable to the entire subdivision's legal rights to preserve both their, their stated, deeded, and implied rights. That was, that was a big piece of, um, of this that we were very clear that we wanted. So those are sort of three jumbled questions. Sure. Um, Madam Chair, can I just interrupt for one second? Uh, I'd also, can we tell the town attorney if answering any of our questions in any way weakens our position, um, can we tell him go ahead and say I'd prefer not to answer that? Yeah, only answer obviously what you can because yeah. some was confidential. Yes, and, and, and Derwood has done so in the past. Great. But okay. thank you. Sure. Um, on balance, um, looking at this agreement, it definitely at least attempts at the extent possible that this can be done through a written agreement uh, on such a complex subject uh, to beef up the rights of the um, the folks that own in, in um, the subdivision. It, and, and I want to be very clear when we're talking about the folks that have deeded rights, those are very strong rights. People in their deed that says they have access over Surfside Avenue, 
Um, that's not really something that's in play. Um, what is more um, of a gray area is the implied rights, but that was what paragraph 13 was about, was not to, to sort of do no harm as far as those implied rights. Now, um, Portland community, the York County community, there's a lot of lawyers with a lot of different opinions. If uh, some lawyer um, out there wants to write a different paragraph or change a word or um, fine tune this in some way, I mean, that, that seems appropriate in terms of the drafting, but uh, oftentimes simpler is better, and I don't think you could put it more simply and directly than we did. And a good t amount of the mediation was spent on you know, potential backlash, unintended consequences for the uh, Goose Rock speech. We call them back lot owners. I don't know if that's a good, good term here, but the folks that live beyond, behind the shorefront properties. And um, that's what this intended language was in, intended to address for sure. I hope, is that, I hope that is responsive to your question. Questions? That does. I guess my final question would be, um, and maybe it's not appropriate to answer, if this were to proceed through litigation and the town lost the litigation, would there be a different outcome on those rights, or are they still separate? Well, yeah, let's just walk through the, the different things that could happen here. One is the um, town could be unsuccessful on, in defending the continuing existence of the paper street, uh, in which case it, the court would be determining that as a matter of law, because of the, basically the passage of time under the common law, uh, those rights are extinguished. Then, then there's you know, no bargaining power at that point to uh, either put in language to attempt to protect the back lot of owners or uh, accept money in return, um, ability to um, have those sort of, sort of benefits. That's what you get in a, in a mediation, is you get the opportunity to craft your own solution. Uh, and, and as a mediator myself, nobody ends up in a mediation you know, walking around jumping for joy that this was awesome and endorphin producing experience. But what you do get is certainty and closure and, and management of a risk, and this is a big risk uh, for the town where the town could spend you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and end up in a, in a worse position. And then the second question is, okay, the paper street still exists, assuming that is the outcome. Can it be used for walking trail? As I said, that's an unanswered question in Maine law. And perhaps maybe the question before that is, do we even want it to be used as a walking trail and take on that responsibility? So you might end up with a result where you won, but you said, after considering it all, you're, you're thinking, there's no way we want to take this over as a, and, and create a walking trail here because of the, for example, the topographical features of it, the risk factors that might be inherent in that. That's why you, you're on the council. We present the information for you. Um, but as far as an agreement goes, every attempt was made to balance all of those points and, and particularly uh, given uh, consideration to the extent possible for the private uh, property rights. But that's not the town's job, you know, re really to protect those rights. But we were certainly aware of them. Can you just remind us of what the public rights are? What does the general public right now have the right to do? Okay, this is a really important um, question. The question is, you know, what are the public rights? Actually, the public has no rights right now. And I think there's a, a mis misperception or maybe a misunderstanding about that. All the public has through the town is a, an incipient, meaning a, a yet to be born right to accept this road. But, but just because it's on the paper street list doesn't mean it, the public either owns a property, owns a road, or members of the public have to um, have the right to pass over it. Only the private rights cause that. And it would require the second step of acceptance to for those public rights to sort of migrate into the other category. Just to follow up on that, if we were to accept it, we then have to fight the lawsuit of whether we can put a path on it. And then if we win that lawsuit and put a path on it and take on the responsibility of putting a path, that is the only avenue in which the public would have access right, to go across right, the property. Right. Is that and, correct? And, and I think that there's a misunderstanding. You think you hear paper street, protect our paper street, Paper Street is an idea that has to 
it's a, it's a, it's a legal right that has to be um, formalized through an acceptance and then a process if you were going to create a, a, a path on it, um, I'm pretty confident there'd be a, cha a challenge to that. Councilor Garvin? I was going to ask the same question but in a slightly different way because either tonight through comments or through emails or conversations that we've had, I think there's been sentiment that says, oh, you all should just be accepting this, not considering a settlement agreement, et cetera, et cetera. But the settlement agreement is born out of the specific litigation that we're engaged in. That's correct. Whether or not we, and the, and the current status it was to extend the incipient right, um, even, even if we were tonight to vote to accept, that doesn't remove the specter of the litigation that we're engaged with, and it really doesn't change, I don't think, uh, materially any um, of the key variables in that litigation. So I, I, I think that those, uh, I guess I'll ask you a, as a question, would you agree with me that those issues are being conflated slightly here and right. that- Right, we, we have a live case no matter what, exactly. what you do, whether you accept or, or, or don't accept, and a live case uh, that um, has um, a certain amount of risk for the town, regardless of costs. Just to follow up yep. on that, actually, if we were to accept, it would trigger the second part of the lawsuit, correct? Because right, right now, with it just being extended, we're battling one lawsuit, and then if we were to accept, it triggers the second I think there would be a second lawsuit or an amendment to this first lawsuit to so add that in as an, yet another claim. Uh, Council Lennon? Um, are you able to speculate or just take a guesstimate of should we um, disregard this settlement and proceed with the litigation, what we're looking at for a time frame if we include the current one we're embroiled in and um, a likely uh, appeal? Years. Like how and, many? Um, it's hard to know. The Goose Rocks case has, has been going on, you know, between five and ten years now. Um, the, the, there's motions that are pending with the court that will take months to decide. Uh, the judge may not decide them um, before a trial. A trial could be held perhaps next year if there's an appeal to the main Supreme Court. Um, that's a, a very lengthy process and oftentimes the court sits on the outcome because it's complicated for many months. Um, so two, three, four years. Oftentimes what happens too is the decision of the appeals court results in some sort of, um, not necessarily a reversal, but what they call a remand, where they send it back and ask the trial court to take another look at this one particular point or explain something a little better than it did. It goes back, then it goes back up. Um, in in uh, Kenny Bunkport, which involves the entire Goose Rocks, I think they're between a million and two million on, on legal, um, more than the two million side on, on, the, on the legal on that. Uh, it's a you know bigger case for sure, but these these cases are in, intensive in terms of facts and in terms of witnesses, and maybe even expert witnesses. Council Straw, uh, I was hoping perhaps you'd give a little color on that. In particular, uh, can you kind of refresh our recollection as to what the current status is on the litigation? In particular, is there? Or are there any particular outstanding motions? And if so, what are they? And what are the implications of the decision on those motions? Right. Um, in this case, there are there is a pending motion for summary judgment on basically uh, the second part of the case, which is whether the um, Surfside Avenue can be used as a, a path. And, and that is something that we have not responded to because of the mediation. We have an agreement with the other side that the case has stayed, and so there'll be that that first question and, and motion that will be decided at some point by the judge. One, one thing that a court can do is is say, I'm not going to decide this right now, um, and, and the, sometimes the court holds off even to trial or through trial um, before deciding pending motions, and, and that's one of the, the possibilities that was brought up in mediation as a possibility. So it's procedurally complex, it's factually complex. Um, That's what we do for a living, um, and we're happy to you know, keep on doing it. But it's, um, it's, it's, I sort of feel like it's like a military exercise. If you've been there and done that, you've, you realize what, you know, what a toll it can take. And 
And as I said, the mediation is you know, sometimes a, a situation where um, it's sort of dissatisfying in a sense. You, you want to have your day in court, but the day in court is actually a lot less satisfying than you, you might think it, it would be. You'd think it'd be sort of like a, on television where the justice would be meted out, but really what would happen is the, the justices are extremely uh, professional, but they're just going to intake all the information and say, we're going to get back to you. And they'll get back to you in their own time and in their own way. And oftentimes the results in these cases is a result that leaves both sides looking at the paperwork and saying, we don't understand, we didn't even ask for that, but this is what happened. And that's the difference between this process where you can control the outcome versus turning it over to a, a third party. Any other questions for Derwood? Just one thing. Yeah. You did an excellent job explaining that all. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So let's see. Uh, moving along, is there a motion to send the proposed settlement agreement to a public hearing to begin the Dean vacation process of a Paper Street section of Surfside Avenue? Is Councilor Lennon moves? So moved. Councilor, I think actually Council Straw's hand went up. Yeah. It doesn't matter second. how take the second or the move, whichever. Okay. Now for discussion. Councilor Straw. Uh, so obviously you're all free to make whatever comments you want at the public hearing, um, but I want to just make a couple of very brief comments. Uh, number one, with respect to Miss uh, I apologize, I always get your last name wrong, Valent. Uh, Valent's comment regarding the public hearing. My understanding of our rules is once a public hearing starts, anyone who hasn't yet spoken gets an opportunity. It's not just a 15 minute period like with one of these. If it's an official public hearing, then it goes. Um, so I could be wrong, but that's my understanding. So everyone who's here gets to make a comment. Um, so that's my understanding. But May I yep. add something to that, Councilor Straw? Uh, with the public hearing, um, the public hearing will continue as long as the public wants to speak to the town council. We, and that's state law. We do limit each person to three minutes, but we will be here as long as the public wants to talk to us. Uh, so uh, next, uh, Mr. Murphy, your comment about the whereas clause. I understand your point, thank you. Um, then specifically with the, what people choose to comment on, what I would really find useful um, is A, speak to the contours of the settlement, how the overall structure is, separate from the numbers and everything else in it. How, how do you feel about the contours? That's number one. Uh, number two is the amount. Um, which I think uh, Councillor Garvin got at. Is, is the issue with the contours of the settlement or the amount from a dollar perspective? So um, if anyone can offer feedback or uh, comments about the amount, is, is your issue the contours, is it the amount, if it's the amount, what would be an acceptable amount? And to help put that into uh, as just a, uh, a thought process that I engage in, if that was a $2 billion offer, I think everyone in this room would accept it. Uh, so there is some number that is sufficient. Um, what is that number? Is it $2? Is it $200,000? Is it $50 million? Is it $100 million? What is that number? So I'd like to hear that. And then finally, if you have any comments about any weaknesses that you see uh, in the, the, um, the proposal, I'd like to hear those too. Council Lennon? I don't think that the money amount is germane here. Um, first of all, it's not going to change. And second of all, Contrary to what appears to be popular belief, we were not swayed by the money. That was the last consideration that we cared about. Um, I think it's great that we have some money for the land acquisition fund. It's a bonus. Um, but most of all, our job here is to manage um, risk. That's what you elect us to do. We're also in charge of representing all of the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. And I understand that you guys here feel incredibly passionately about this. I totally get that. Um, I, I, and, I, and I sympathize with you. Um, and, I, and I understand it. But what you have to understand is we're looking at this in a very big picture. You have 1,400 signatures on that, but that leaves almost 8,000 citizens um, who are looking at us saying, what are you doing with our tax dollar? We have lengthy discussions all year about tax money. We argue over a fraction of this on the school budget. So it's our job not to waste tax money, and more importantly, not to take huge risks with it. 
We don't get to go to the poker table or you know, go down to Vegas and play blackjack with your tax dollars. This outcome of this lawsuit is highly uncertain. It's another, um, I think, misperception out there is that like we just need to stick to this and, and spend whatever it takes and hang in there for all these years because we have a great case and we're going to win. That is not the advice we've received. So I feel hurt when people say we're being threatened. We're not being threatened. We're, we're, we're trying to apply our very best judgment with a, 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 a complex set of facts and some unknowns in the future. Um, and I will not sort of go on at length because we're going to have a public hearing, but it is, it is my belief that um, this settlement is a very responsible way to manage that considerable risk. Um, and that's what this issue is about. It is not about wealthy versus non-wealthy. It's not about bribery. It's not about th being threatened. It's not about us not listening to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. It's about our trying to embrace our role in the largest sense possible. And I guess I think it would be helpful if people would keep that in mind. This isn't an us versus them at all. I mean, we're in a tough position. Everybody can see that. So I would encourage people at the public hearing to bear that in mind and not, not, not get angry. We're, we're all trying to do the best we can. Thanks. Councilor Garvin? I was just going to add to what Chris was saying about um, in responding to Ms. Warren's comments. Um, while we haven't scheduled it or, or taken definitive action as such, I think it's been our intent through our discussions that um, we would hold the public hearing uh, at our regularly scheduled September meeting and then set a special meeting uh, to vote on this subsequent to the public hearing and not have the vote the same night. So. Yes, and I was going to thank you for bringing that up. That's something I was going to just mention to the public. I have a question for Durwood, um, if you wouldn't mind. Considering some of the comments we've heard tonight, and you know, we'll be, I'm sure, setting a public hearing for this. Um, what would be the process of renegotiating the settlement if, after hearing? from citizens during the, during the public hearing. The council were interested in revisiting that agreement for whatever reason. How would that, how would that work? How would that proceed? Well, you know, first and foremost, uh, we have to continue to always negotiate in good faith. And I think that the town certainly has done that so far. And I think the uh, property owners certainly have negotiated in good faith. And we've worked very um, collegially um, but not in a, um, in collaboratively, but, but as advocates and, and opponents uh, to come up with language uh, that, you know, is appropriate for both sides. Um, I'm, I don't, I don't think you can rule out the possibility of, um, you know, some wording change here that might well be acceptable if somebody has a, a better, you know, word or sentence than what uh, previously exists. And certainly, um, we could discuss that with the attorneys. Um, but and um, with regard to the money, I think that that is a more problematic. Um, and um, I, th I think um, it's probably inappropriate to talk about that any further in this open forum. But I, th I would be very cautious about attempting to um, disrupt what's, what's currently there in terms of a, an offer to resolve the case. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, any other comments? No? Um, uh, again, um, even though ultimately if this proceeds forward, uh, you know, there would be a, the vacation ultimately, but again, us setting this voting to set a public hearing tonight for September 10th does not in and of itself begin the vacation process. So I just want to be, again, very clear about that. Um, you know, as I, you know, I appreciate Council Lennon's comments, you know, the three of us did spend a very long day working and uh, working hard to, to do our best for the town. And, um, and I think we did. Uh, 
I'm personally opposed. I, I do feel that there are principles worth fighting for, and, and when we get down to more deliberations, I'm sure we'll be all saying even more about that. There is um, the um, consensus upon the council to set a special meeting after the September 10 public hearing. So we don't know exactly when that will be, but we, it will be certainly before the regular October 10, wait a minute, is it October 10? The October council meeting. The regular one, I don't have that date. I believe it is October it, 10. October 10, okay. So it would be before then. But the council consensus was to set a special meeting just for this vote at some point after the public hearing, uh, which is at our on our September 10? So. Uh, September uh, 10th would be the public hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Which is our regular, regular town council regular meeting. Schedule. Yes, so, sorry. Anyway. So yeah. anyway, thanks, uh, James, for bringing that up. Any more comments? All those in favor of setting this, the Paper Street uh, Settlement proposal to the public hearing at the uh, September 10 regular town council meeting. All those in favor. It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Item number 118, the request of the Cape Elizabeth School Board to set to referendum an inter-local agreement for the Greater Sebago Education Alliance Regional Service Center. Uh, I don't know if we have anyone here from the school. No, You're going to, to speak to yeah. that? Shall I have Tom come in first? I'll be sure to come in. I'll let everybody clear up. Clear the road. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wait, it's not a warm in here. It's nice and warm. Can I ask about the public hearing? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, item number 118, the request of the Cable of the School Board to set to referendum an interlocal agreement with the Greater Sebago Education Alliance Regional Service Center. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item? All right, seeing no one, I'll close that comment period. We do not have anyone here from the school board. Our town manager is going to um, represent the school board in presenting this item. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, I, I did have the opportunity to speak with uh, both uh, former Superintendent Howard Coulter as well as uh, current uh, Superintendent uh, Donna. Donna Wolfram, sorry, I was having a senior moment there. Uh, Donna Wolfram, uh, this is a, uh, an effort that's been taken underway by nine different school departments. And you might have noticed over the course of the spring and uh, during the voting period uh, on a number of different municipal ballots that they were, uh, Portland for instance, and South Portland and Scarborough I think all had this on their different, uh, different warrants for approval uh, to join uh, in the partnership with the Greater Sebago Education Alliance. There was uh, ultimately the, the legislature acted or the Department of Education acted to create uh, these opportunities for collaboration among school departments, uh, trying to uh, encourage different schools to work together to, to find answers instead of each individual school trying to find solutions to each individual problem. So what they ended up doing was trying to incentivize this by if you did join one of these uh, educational alliances, that you would receive additional state funding to, to, to encourage uh, with the carrot, I guess, uh, the way to move forward. So what that would result in in the current year is, is would have been $46 per student or about $72,000, almost $73,000 in additional state revenue by making the commitment to participate in regional collaborations where they've presented the opportunities. Uh, in the upcoming year or the, the, the the, the next year, they're looking to bump that up to $96 per student, so they are trying to put some money behind uh, their encouragement. However, that being said, this needs to be approved by the voters. Uh, the school board, I understand, has taken a look at this and accepted it, but it needs to be sent to the, to the voters of the town to, in a, via the referendum uh, process to approve it. 
because September is also uh, the, the month in which the ballot is set. Uh, that's why we put it on the agenda this evening, so uh, you have the opportunity to, to get that, and Debbie could order ballots so we could take care of absentee voters to make sure they have the opportunity to weigh in on this question. Uh, Superintendent Wolfram would have been here this evening, however, she had a scheduled, scheduled, uh, scheduled vacation, so, um, but I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. There's, uh, within your council packets, there's a, the first uh, packet item pretty much lays it all out there, but it's, uh, but there is no, penalty for not doing it, but there is a benefit by joining into this collaboration. And it's, uh, there are a number of schools that already have signed off on it. You can see the signature pages there later, but, but it is, it looks like it, it is a benefit. And this is the state trying to encourage regionalization instead of from the, the top down approach to try to sweeten the deal. Thank you, Matt. Sure. Um, yeah, it looks like it. I certainly applaud this effort. Um, is there a motion to approve the request of the school board to set to referendum and interlocal local agreement with the Greater Sebago Education Alliance Regional Service Center. So moved. Councilor Caitlin Jordan, is there a second? Councilor Jamie Garvin, discussion. Well, again, I'd like to applaud the school department. I mean, this looks, I've you know, read through the documents. This is, this is uh, I think, a very good step. And um, so I, very pleased to, to uh, approve this myself anyway. <laughs> any, any comments at all? All right. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Okay, item number 119, a request to amend the sewer service area at 33 Wells Road. Uh, would anyone from the public like to speak to this item? Seeing no one, I will close the comment period. Uh, and I don't see public works or anything, so again, I'll ask the town manager to, to uh, tell us a little bit about this. Thank you, Madam Chairman, I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Sarka own a home that's on 33 Wells Road, which is just beyond uh, the Jordan Farm. Uh, and if you look I at- I was going to disclose that <laughs> to <after> you. <laughs> May I disclose they're our neighbors? Okay. They're also here tonight. <laughs> yeah, Our exactly. Been, quite, a patient, quite a long time. So if, if you look at the sewer yep. service area map, you'll right. notice that there is a mm -hmm. polygon middle that wall. is mm -hmm. carved out right in the middle of it, uh, of the sewer service area. And this happens to be where Mr. and Mrs. Sarka and their family live. And they would like to do some additional work on their property. However, they need an expansion of their septic system, which would right. be prohibitively large to do, and as well as uh, this would allow them some flexibility and surety going forward to, to have the service. Uh, it wasn't overlooked, as many may see by looking at the map. It actually, when they did establish the sewer service area, it was on larger properties is how they did. So a few years back, um, Sue Gabriel, who has a smaller parcel just further up the street, actually had a similar action that had taken place so they could uh, extend the sewer service area there. It is stubbed in front of their house, so they can make an easy connection. Uh, and they are looking to do get the work accomplished. What the request is tonight is that the council receives the request, refers it to the planning board, and then the planning board would review this and hopefully get it on their uh, September agenda, refer it back to the council, and, uh, and then the council would have it on, uh, the earliest we could get it would be on the October agenda to have for action. That being said, the one question that I would like to just put out to the council as well in, in trying to do my own scorecard keeping for later in the year, uh, would the council be opposed that evening to have, when you do have a public hearing to amend the sewer service area, to also have uh, that evening to accept, vote yeah, to vote on it, I guess, mm -hmm. to take action. I know I mean, with more controversial subjects, it's usually <laughs> a problem, however, with right. this, it seems like it should be. You know, fairly well, cut and dry. And we'll have the planning board recommendation by that. You will have all that lined up at that point in time. And yeah. they are under construction, so they'd like to also have, you know, time is of the essence as well. Sure. Well, you know, I, uh, just a second, uh, Council and I, I'm glad you mentioned that it wasn't overlooked, because when I was looking at the, the map, I thought, how is this not yeah. <laughs> connected? Uh, Councilor Lennon was first, and then Councilor Garvin. I, I just, I just have a quick question. So. Does this sewer, because I know Maureen is, always wants to connect people to sewer, which you can. It's more environmental, <laughs> yeah. it's more economic. I mean, it's, right, we talk about this all the time in the complaint. So 
Does the sewer line run literally past their house? Yes. So we're not having to take it from Wells Road. I thought it stopped at Wells. No, it's there's they have a connection it's directly in front of their house that they'll be able to connect to. So, I mean, if I may, I don't understand why I have to jump through two months of hoops. This seems like a complete no-brainer. Well said, Councilor <laughs> Lennon. Uh, it just happened. I mean, do we really have to send this to the planning board? They're going to say absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. It, in order to do that, you need to revise the map so it does include that parcel, and then uh, they legitimately have the ability to, it's per the ordinance, the ability yep. to, to tie in. And it does seem like a hoop, sorry. And may, no, and may, may I add, I remember there was a similar request some years ago when I was on ordinance, and I, I recall that one of the reasons this something like this goes before the planning board, the, the big 10,000 view is make sure we're not overloading our current system. Oh, okay. How many, you know, what are, that's really not the case here, but that's one of the reasons, apparently, why these things are reviewed. One of the reasons, there are many, but anyway, so. And if any consolation yep. sta staff is fully in support of this as well from all, all facets of the operation. Okay. I was just gonna ask, does the planning board need to have a public hearing on it too, or is that not, not required? I don't think it is okay. for this, but I, it's you It's just know. review and okay. recommend. Okay. I mean, I think if there were a new subdivision requiring all sort of municipal infrastructure and all that, that'd be one thing, perhaps, I don't know, but I don't think this does. Okay, any other comments or questions? All right, all those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. We need a motion. A second. Uh, we sorry. didn't have a motion yet? I, I apologize. <laughs> Is there a motion to, to um, uh, request, I'm sorry, to approve the request to send this sewer service area request to the planning board? So moved. Councilor Sarah Lennon, and I think Jamie, you raised your hand. Councilor Jamie Carvin, sure. second. All, any more comments? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Open along here. No motion. Okay, item number 120 consideration of agreement with Leica Geosystems Incorporated. Um, is there anyone from the public that would like to speak to this item? Okay, Leica Systems wants to put a tower on. Requesting putting a tower on our fire station. Anyone would like to speak to this item? Seeing no one, I'll close the public comment period and again ask the town manager to uh, introduce this item. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd be happy to. Uh, I was approached by a representative of Leica uh, Geosystems uh, to see about the, you know, the potential to locate at one of these towers on uh, in the town center and. In the past, what they have done in, in different communities is they would try to find buildings, you know, that are of substantial construction that they know are not going to be changing anytime soon, that are fairly centrally located, as well as have a decent geographical area that they can represent this from. Uh, what this is is an antenna, and if you uh, had, had the opportunity to re review your package, you'll notice it's a, it's a fairly small imprint as far as the antenna goes, uh, similar to the size of almost like a Wi-Fi hub on top of, a, of, a, of an aluminum pole that would be mounted to the side of the building. We, we do already have some antennas mounted to the side of the fire station. Uh, what this antenna does is provide uh, GIS or, or signal to improve, sorry, GPS signals uh, to a much greater detail than what is currently allowed with the current structure. So it would go from say an accuracy of say 30 feet down to an accuracy of less than three feet. Uh, who would find this important? GIS or GPS users, uh, such as surveyors, uh, folks who are doing uh, mapping, construction, engineering, so they can get a much more accurate read as to the information that they need. Uh, they're obviously monetizing this by creating a system across the country to try to do this. However, uh, they realize that by monetizing that, they, they, they would like to pay the hosts uh, an annual fee. So that's why we brought this in here this evening. They will be paying us $1,500 annually uh, to locate this on there. I did speak with Chief Gleason and uh, he was very comfortable with having that located on the building. Uh, they, they take care of their installation. They would do everything with, you know, looking at what the chief would find the best uh, location to put it on there. Uh, it uses pennies worth of electricity over the course of a year. I mean, they're very low, low energy users. Um, but just looked at this as a way to, one, improve maybe potentially public service, but also, two, to generate income for the town, although it is a, a small expense, but it's, but it's something that I think uh, was useful to bring forward to the council for consideration. Thank you. 
Is there a motion to uh, approve the agreement to host the SmartNet GNSS Reference Network antenna to be located on the Town Center Fire Station at 2 Jordan Way? So moved. Councilor Penny Jordan, is there a second? Councilor Straw, any discussion? Councilor Straw. Uh, just a comment for the town manager. Um, I'm fine with this as it is, uh, but I'd ask that you keep this in the back of your head and with like three years or so, um, bring it back up so we can contemplate whether we should raise the annual fee as inflation passes. So. I, I'd be happy to, Councilor Straw. The, the other, one other item I forgot to mention, if I, if I may, through the chair. Uh, we, you do have, as you may have noticed, but looking at the contract, the ability to end the, end the relationship with a fairly short period of, uh, of notification. So there, is, uh, there are protections there as well. But I, I, I very much appreciate Councilor Straw's thoughts on that. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Councilor Garvin. Just curious if they've done other similar municipal installations, and I assume that the 1500 is effectively the going rate. Yes, it, it is the going rate. They, they've done it on... on you know, on personal homes, uh, churches, uh, other areas like that, uh, that would be higher profile installations that aren't going to be going very far. But, uh, but they did approach us because they thought that it sounds funny because uh, you know how challenging the signals are here, but they found the geography of Cape to be extremely uh, valuable to them as far as providing a, uh, I think their service area is about 300 miles with this antenna. Right. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, 121, establishment of an energy committee. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this item? Seeing no one, I will close the com uh, public comment opportunity. Um, <clears throat> On, on the 9th of July, we voted to send uh, the consideration of the Standing Renewable Energy Committee back to the Ordinance Committee for review. They have uh, met and voted unanimously to recommend the following, and we will all have this in our documents, uh, uh, wording on establishment of an energy committee. Is there a motion? I would probably ask if the Ordinance Chairman would like to have that privilege. Yes, um, I would move that um, we move forward with establishing the energy uh, committee. Um, I know this is, um, and that we um, move it forward as quickly as we can. So motion to form the energy committee. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilor Caitlin Jordan, any discussion? Councilor Straw? Uh, um, so to the extent this is the motion to actually uh, establish it, I would just note that the draft we have, subsection I, uh, one membership, we still have renewable. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. It has an it. extraneous <laughs> word in it. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, Ms. Councilor Straw, you actually, uh, you, you, you sunk my battleship. I had, a, I had two items that I just wanted to uh, let the council know of. There are two, uh, there are two, uh, like, I guess you could say, non-substantial amendments that I will take care of before then. One is that we'll, we'll make sure it doesn't have it as the revision energy committee, which we have on the uh, <laughs> attachments. And then second, I'll, I'll make sure I had one renewable that that popped its that reared its ugly head in there that I <laughs> could not catch. But we will have that we'll have that amendment done or that edit done. I apologize for that. Thank you, and, and in, in just the heat and humidity, uh, I neglected to point out that what we are, I believe, in, one, in my request for motion, that what we're doing is we're, we're going to send this to a public hearing. We're not actually approving the proposal for the committee. We're, we're sending this to a public hearing. And um, so I just want to clarify that. We have to, because it's a zoning, yes. it's an ordinance change. That's right. So, so, so I, I'm looking at the faces, and I'm like, yes, we have yeah. to. And, I, <laughs> and, and I, I knew that, and I, I neglected to oh. make that clear. Okay. Um, I, I have one additional yeah. question for May through, May through the chair. As I stated or asked earlier on a less, uh, less impactful question, is the council uh, amenable to me uh, placing on the agenda the public hearing that evening, as well as subsequent action to, to adopt that? If you please, okay. September. I, I didn't. I, I didn't want to make that assumption without uh, seven or six of my uh, uh, so, <laughs> bosses telling me that's motion. okay. Yeah. 
Okay, so would you please? Yes, Thank revised you. motion is to uh, move the uh, Energy Committee to a public hearing in September. Um, and then at that time, we can also vote on it? Yeah. Yes, that's my motion. Thank you. With, would you like to, with the, with the amendments, the recommended uh, wording changes? Mm -hmm. that, oh, yeah. the, taking the renewable out? Yeah. I'll take care of yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a second? Councilor Straw. Okay. Any more discussion? I think it's great. I mean, we, we've, we've looked at this several times, and I'm, I'm certainly very happy to go ahead and vote after public hearing. So, yep. All right. All those, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. We're down to the last item, number 122. <clears throat> May Municipal Association voting ballot. Is there anyone who would like to speak to this item? Seeing no one, I'll close the public comment opportunity. Uh, I will again ask the town manager to introduce this, that we are being asked to approve the Maine Municipal Association voting ballot for 2019 as proposed. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, this is an annual event about this time uh, every year, and what you have is the slate of officers that are uh, recommended for the Maine Municipal Association. You have Christine Landis, who is the town manager. For, actually, she's now the, uh, for the town of our city of Gardner now. She had moved when they, after they printed the ballot, but they did revise that. Uh, also, they have uh, three other members for the executive committee, Elaine Allos from the chair of selectmen, uh, the select board of the town of Solon, William Briggio, who's the city manager for the city of Augusta, and Melissa Doan, who's the town manager of the town of Bradley. And you'll notice that there are no other alternative selections, so it's a straight, straight shot. Uh, so we'll, uh, what I would need would be a motion to accept the, uh, the voting ballot as proposed, and I will sign it and stamp it and send it tomorrow. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to approve the uh, Maine Municipal Association voting, Association voting ballot for 2019 as proposed? Councilor Jamie Garvin. Count, uh, second, Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. At this uh, time, we have the opportunity for citizens to bring a topic before the council that is not on tonight's agenda. Would anyone like to speak to the council for, about something that is not on the agenda? Seeing no one, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? We are adjourned. Great. Not quite